jump to the word, I want to um, just one more quick announcement. If you have um, your uh, form for the, the, the fund to drive uh, for the capital campaign project, please uh, get it in today. And if you didn't bring it with you, there are more on the back table you can pick up and bring back to the church sometime later on today. Friends, I invite you to open your ears, listen to a preacher of Hebrews, beginning in chapter 4, the first 10 verses. Pick up the Bible and read along, if that helps you to drink in the text, if it's better for you to just close your eyes and listen, do that. Do whatever it takes to hear and to drink in God's word to us today. Therefore, since the promise that we can enter into the rest is still open to us, let's be careful so that none of you may appear to miss it. We also had the good news preached to us, just as the Israelites did. However, the message they heard didn't help them, because they weren't united in faith with the ones who listened to it. We who have faith are entering the rest. As God said, and because of my anger I swore, they shall never enter into my rest. And yet God's works were completed at the foundation of the world. And somewhere else he said about the seventh day of creation, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. But again, in the passage above, God said, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, it's left open for some to enter. And the ones who have the good news preached to them before didn't enter because of disobedience. But just as it says in the passage above, God designates a certain day as today. When later, he says through David, today, if you hear his voice, do not let your hearts be stubborn. If Joshua had given the Israelites rest, God wouldn't have spoken about another day later on. So you see that a Sabbath rest is left open for God's people. The one who entered God's rest also rested from his works, just as God rested from his own. And this is the word of the Lord. If you are thankful, say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. For a split second, time in the air stood still. His tiny body contracted ever so slightly, drinking thirstily at the atmosphere, only to prepare for another ear splitting chorus of shrieks. The boy's got lungs, I would say. He 
He's also got a nurse job. He sleeps great at night. But when he's awake during the day, oh, he wants to stay that way. And anything to the contrary was met with this stentorian chorus of cries. It had been a long week, a little long month, it'd been a long day. And I was sitting there holding my infant son. He was clearly exhausted. Plain as the nose on his face. But he wouldn't rest. The author of Hebrews, we don't really know who it is. So oftentimes in church history, we just call him the preacher. Because Hebrews is essentially a sermon that's written down. The preacher in chapter 4 is working with the word rest. Kind of on three different levels. He means three different things. The first thing that he means by rest is talking about the creation rest. And of course, because the preacher is addressing the Hebrews, we're talking about the Old Testament. The preacher here in chapter 4 is talking about the Exodus movement when the people of Israel were on their way out of slavery, out of forced work, into the promised land, the promised rest. But the preacher is saying, but remember, the ones that actually left, they didn't actually get to see the rest. The generation that left Egypt was not the same generation that was able to actually benefit from living in the promised land. They all died in the desert. That's what the preacher here is talking about. He's saying, remember? Remember how God so powerfully delivered the people, our people, us? Delivered us out of Egypt. But even though God delivered them, they didn't enter the rest. Which is really strange, the preacher says, because do you remember what God said? The preacher reminds, do you remember what God said way back in Genesis? He reminds us. God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. God rested on the seventh day, the preacher says. This is how creation began. Creation began as a place of rest. If creation began as a place of rest, now how is it, how is it that people who live in the middle of creation, how could it possibly be that God would ever say of people living in creation that they would never enter God's rest? They're by definition living in the middle of the rest that God had quite literally created. Creation as rest. It's the first way that the preacher talks about rest. The preacher says... When God created the world, He rested. This is the reality of the world that God made. The world of rest. But, but those people, no, not those people, our people, they wouldn't rest. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't live in reality. They wouldn't live in the reality that God had made for them, but they were determined to fashion a new reality. They were determined to fashion a new reality where God was either not good, or maybe God wasn't in control, or maybe God was just taking a nap. So we're kind of on our own. We better look out for ourselves. Because if we don't, no one else is going to. People of God would not live in a world of rest that God had made, but they were determined to fashion a world of their own. They were determined to live in a world where they were content to ruin someone else's reputation in order to save their own. They were determined to live in a world that was bound with no room for anything else by the, the laws of, of nature of the free market. They were determined to live in such a way that they would not acknowledge 
the world that God made. God made. The world of rest. Like my son that was holding him. I can't think. Your diaper's dry. Your belly is full. You've been burped. You're swaddled. You're cozy. The room is dark and it's cool. You have everything that you need. Could you just rest? Could you, could you just rest? And I thought, how often does God hold us in his arms? Saying, my child, could you just rest? The world that I have made. Is a world of rest. Now, of course, when God rested, come before Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, we hear the story of how Adam and Eve were bound and determined to make the world in a way that made sense to them. And after that, God said, You will work in the ground. You will plow it. It will not produce corn. It will produce weeds. It will produce thistles and thorns. It's not even going to be easy to pull them out of the ground. You're going to hurt yourself trying to take out the bad stuff in order to care for and cultivate the good. This has become the world as we know it. This is the world that the Israelites knew too. It's how they grew up. They learned that you can't always trust people. They learned that sometimes your best friend will turn around and stab you in the back. They learned that sometimes, 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 they picked up inertia. They got used to living in the world a certain way. They got used to expecting that they couldn't trust the people that they were with. They picked up inertia and, and they began to, to expect to expect the thorns coming out of that. There's a second way that the preacher talks about rest. The preacher talks about rest as redemption. Redemption. Rest as creation and rest as redemption. Because if we are honest, the world of thorns is not a restful world. Am I right? Thorns out of the ground. Thorns out of other people's mouths. Thorns out of the systems that we live in. This is what it means that there is a rest. This is what it means that Christ has come into the world. Christ has come into the world to renew the face of the ground, to reverse the curse, to put those thorns back in the ground. When Christ is king, you work the ground and it doesn't make thorns. It grows whatever you plant. When Christ is king, you speak words and people actually hear what you're saying. They really hear what you're saying. This is rest as redemption. Verse 8, if Joshua give, gave the Israelites rest, God wouldn't have spoken about another day later on. Preacher saying, if, if God's work is all done in the past, if God's work is all done in the past, then and the rest is something that already happened and then we fell out of. If that's all that God had in mind, then... He wouldn't talk about another rest later on. But he did. But he did. And the rest that has come to us is the person of Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus, all of this, all of this inertia is being checked. The path that we were on, the path that we thought was the only way forward, the only way we knew how to live. 
Jesus checked that inertia and is giving us a new trajectory. A new trajectory. Giving us a hope where there will be one day, one day, those who confess the name of Christ will be raised from the dead to new bodies made imperishable, like the body of Jesus Christ himself after the resurrection. This is what we hope for. On that day, on that day when Christ is king and we are brought out of the grave, on that day there will be no more war. There will be no more tears for God will wipe every one from your eye. There will be no more division. This is heaven. This is the world to come that has been promised us. We know it for sure. As surely as Christ has risen from the grave, so surely with all those who confess His name and believe in Him will follow Him out of their grave to a new life, to a new embodied life in a world the way God intended it. The world of rest. Maybe you've caught this, but the rest that God is offering us is not a couch potato sort of rest. Right? The rest that God has for us is very much about our daily lives. And this is the third way that the preacher talks about rest. Because between the rest of creation and the rest of redemption. The preacher says there is a Sabbath rest now. Verse 3. We who have faith are entering the rest. Again, verse 9. So you see that a Sabbath rest is left open. A rest that echoes the rest of creation and anticipates the rest of redemption. A rest that God is giving to you now. Says so Holy Brennan. The rest was right there. All he had to do was relax into it, but he didn't know how. Didn't know how. He just told me this. Just a little guy. It was up to me to teach him. I had to teach him that it was a safe space. I had to teach him that he could rest. I'm grateful that I don't have to do that alone, but that I have a partner. Chris and I get to do this together to teach him to rest. Friends, as we are here as Christians, as a body, it is up to us to teach each other that God has given us rest. Now, a rest that we, that takes faith to practice because the world still feels thorny. Your fingers sore? Mine are. It takes faith. But God has promised that those who live by faith, when we live by faith, we will see. We will see. When we live by faith that Christ is King now, when we live that way now, Christ's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, it's here. Jesus has started it. But when we take a leap of faith and trust that we too can rest, we welcome God's kingdom in such a way 
that it comes. It's not fully here yet. And it won't be until Jesus returns and makes all things well. But our calling as community of God's people is to not forget the story. To not forget the story that God is making all things new. And that there is a rest. And that we get to look forward to it fully, but that we also need to taste it right now. That's our calling. That's our calling, is to not forget this, that this is what God is doing. So as the preacher says in the previous chapter, encourage one another. And do it every day, because we need it. I need it. We need it. We are not going to remember the story unless we remind each other. I'm talking about chapter 3, verse 13. If we do not remind each other and encourage each other, we're going to lose the plot. So encourage one another. As long as it is called today. Amen. Let's walk with each other. Let's say no to the inertia that we have picked up. The expectations we have. He was where? Oh, of course he was. I could have told you she said that. Let's put these things away. Because God is in the world. He's doing the work. He's giving us rest. Do you trust it? Do you trust it? Give us the grace, the faith, the hope in the rest that you that you've given us right now, partial though it is. Help us to echo the rest of creation, to anticipate the rest of redemption. Help us to be your people of rest here and now. May our fathers and the Holy Spirit.